And now for something completely machinima. Tracy Harwood. Um, so I've done a little bit of digging around and I've discovered. Ricky Grove. Fog comes in on little cat feet. <laughs> Phil Rice. This is the best film that I've seen all year and maybe ever. Damien Valentine. Use the machinima, Luke. Hello and welcome to And Now for Something Completely Machinima, the podcast about machinima, virtual production, real-time movie making, and all that good stuff. My name is Phil Rice. I'm here with my co-hosts, Damian Valentine and Tracy Harwood. Hello. Hello. Ricky is off just up to no good. <laughs> That's all. Just up to no good. He'll be back in our next episode. So this week we're going to talk about a film that is uh uh unreal engine short we haven't <laughs> talked about unreal engine in so long i just thought we need to talk about unreal engine so it doesn't feel left out <laughs> uh this one is called forlorn and tracy it was your pick so tell us about it yeah absolutely uh yeah another unreal engine we've had a a few this month that we've talked about and all have been pretty stunning and this is Probably another one that we can put in that category as well. It's an Unreal short called um, Forlorn. It's got its own social platforms um, and it's uh, being promoted under the title of Project Forlorn. It was um, created by a chap called Alex St-Pierre uh, and includes music by a guy called Toft Willingham. It's a little longer than some of the films we reviewed um, that focus on uh, tech demos as creative projects, uh, which is what basically this is. It's 11 minutes long. Um, the film actually was released as a series before the final edit, which resulted in the 11 minute version, which we'll be discussing today. Um, it's already won a bunch of awards and received honorable mentions from film festivals in both the US and Canada. And it was released only in January. Now this creator, um, St. Pierre, he was, the recipient of an Unreal Mega Grant Award. Um, he's an uh, animator and an, uh, a VFX artist based in LA and Vancouver. He has credits <laughs> on a bunch of well-known films too, including The Flash, Black Adam and The Witches, and is also the Unreal Engine supervisor for the upcoming Captain America Brave New World film, which is due out next year. Now, Toff Willingham uh, is the music producer. Um, he is also a screenwriter and filmmaker um, based in L.A. He's the lead singer-songwriter in a rock reggae band called Spiritual Res. Um, he has uh, produced and engineered over 30 albums and co-written with the composer, if I get this right, I should be amazed, Heizai Iwasaki. Um who, uh, um, uh, whom he wrote uh, the hit Japanese anime show with called Blood Blockade Battlefront and also scored the Disney Animation Studio short film Elephant in the Room. He's also co-written a screenplay with his brother, the animator James Willingham III, and the Disney animator Brian Scott. And then the other contributor to the project is actually Lindsay St. Pierre, who is a Disney animator, having worked on projects like Zootopia as a layout and story artist. So again, what we've got here with this particular film is another team with some real uh, animation VFX chops. Now, the project did actually begin as a tech demo in 2018 and was first prototyped in 2019 with what Saint-Pierre describes as a team of one plus a composer and a little bit of assistance with some rigging. Uh, he's used Maya to model, uh, rig and animate the characters, which are all then imported into Unreal, where they've done the lighting and the rendering. Uh, and, you know, um, as I understand it, they've used off the shelf uh, sets um, using Kitbash 3D packs and also some mega scans to get some of the textures um, on, on the assets as well. 
And then, as I understand it, they've done the final edit in Premiere and the sound effects uh, with a with a you know a, a sound effects pack and some home based foley, as as I, I, as I understand it. Now, the creator here has written about the law of the world on the project's website, which basically sets out what the world of Forlorn is about, um, which is focused on this um, central soul tree uh, and with quite a lot of detail um, in that kind of law described on the website that isn't actually in this film at all. So basically, they've got the kind of background to it, but none of it really makes sense in the context of what you see in the film on the, on the screen, so to speak. Um, I guess what you've got, though, is that law being set out for the future development of the project, Project Forlorn. Um, in terms of what we do see, it has basically the aesthetic of a kind of Lara Croft um, type uh, storyline cross with an Indiana Jones type storyline set in the world of kind of an Elden Ring Dark Souls kind of world. Um, and the central character, I think, is quite interesting because rather than having the usual realistic metahuman aesthetic that we might expect with an Unreal film of this kind of quality, it's actually got a 3D Disney look to it. Um, the other characters, the other, the other souls in it uh, are, I think, probably the more interesting part of this. It's got um, a, a sort of a, a, a creature that's a combination of a tree and a and a human hybrid, um, and these trees, tree human things, they're, they're obviously designed to be predatory hunters in this scenario, and the humans are their prey. Um, so rather than the kind of tree beard of Fangorn Forest uh, that we know from the, Ho the Hobbit, it's kind of a little bit more gory than that. Um, the quest is for some kind of stone. It, it kind of looks an uninspiring kind of stone. We don't really know what it's all about. And it's a mission that our heroine has been sent on by these kind of unknown others whom we only meet briefly at the end of the film. So there's a lot of you know, introductions to different characters. There's all this lore um, and a very simple kind of storyline to, to to what we actually see uh, as it kind of unfolds. Um, it's, it's it, I suppose, really, it's got a kind of uh, interesting aesthetic to it. It's sort of adventure, dark fantasy, kind of cosmic horror in 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 genres it's, it's you know they've described it in that way i can kind of get that that's what it is it's maybe a little bit grittier than some of the typical studio projects that um Saint pierre might have worked on um but it's i think it's more more familiar in the in the tale or at least there are a series of familiar tales that are stitched together that it draws on and that may well i think constitute a disney pitch through what it is, through what it is doing, and and what is being shown, so although that's not made explicit in this, and I think notwithstanding the grand plans, I, what I particularly liked about the film is actually that it kept me absorbed for the full eleven minutes because I I thought when I picked it up, I'm never going to sit through eleven minutes of this kind of thing. It's it, it two or three minutes is kind of what what I expect. It's what we're used to when we look at machinima type stuff. Um, and actually, as I as I reflect on it, I'm not sure why it absorbed me for the full 11 minutes, because in places it did feel a little disjointed too. However, um, I don't believe it's really trying to be anything other than the kind of uh, fun that it portrays, if, if, if slightly frightening in its quest. To me, it's clearly aimed at a younger audience, or at least that's the sense I got from it, um, that it's primarily um younger and it, and i got that sense because of the way the the lead character that female um uh heroine if you like uh looks she looks childlike um or appealing to to children is it too dark for kids well i don't think so um doesn't really feel 
typically Disney-ish, I don't suppose. Um, but I have seen some moves go more towards the darker end of uh, of the Disney sort of spectrum, if you like. Um, I think at many levels it's really easy watching. Um, it kind of made me reminisce uh, back to those sort of Saturday morning kids TV programs and maybe what we've got here is a is a replacement for Scooby-Doo um, from, from those years. Um, so that's my take on it. I thought it was um, a really interesting, yet another example of an unreal, you know, um, development, I think. Um, be really interested to hear what you guys have got to say about it. This is probably my favourite film of the month. Is it? Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I watched it and I did get that Elden Ring vibe straight away from it, um, from the bits and pieces that I've seen from that game. But what really struck me was the the imagination that went into creating everything because it's not like you first see the character and she's got armor on and a helmet so so you think oh, this is going to be a medieval or fantasy yeah, kind of thing yeah that's so right. then you see she's got a shotgun or a rifle yeah well, actually this is different because the armor doesn't go with the weapons she's carrying. that's right yeah um so that kind of intrigued me and then she kind of goes into this um big she's going on this quest and she's climbing through and she goes to this big chamber and I thought this these elements don't necessarily match up but they've made it work and then the creatures appear and they're not like creatures you'd expect there there's a lot of thought has gone into these designs um and it's the first creature that she fights the really tall one and and then there's this other monster that appears that it's really hard to describe how it appears because it's um i don't know it's just such an elaborate design like it doesn't have symmetrical features and a lot of work must have spent to just to design it and then to model it and then to animate it because this isn't something you could do motion capture with because you can't do motion capture for creatures that don't resemble the human form um so i don't really know how that they did it unless they did it by hand and it doesn't look like it was keyframe animation. It is stunningly animated. And mm. the, the fight sequence between her and the two monsters and when the two monsters are fighting, um, really breathtaking. Um, and a lot of time has been spent on the rendering as well. So it, it doesn't, it looks stunning. Um, and then at the end, when you see the, the people she's been working for, they don't look like typical designs either. Uh, there's a lot of um, work has been spent into making everything look unique to this world that they've created. And it kind of gives you the sense that this there is more to this world than what you're seeing in this video. Mm. Even though the video focuses on what she's doing and the fights, you, you get the sense of there's more happening just off the camera. Um, and, you know, a lot of the films like like Star Wars, for example, you're focusing on the main characters but the way the world is presented, you know there's other stuff happening all around them. And this film is kind of the same. Um, so it's not necessarily important to the story, but you feel like the world is alive and big. And when you mentioned that there's a law, well, that kind of goes with it. They've obviously mm. developed this world and they're telling one small story in it, but it's clear they've got plans for other stuff, which I'm very intrigued to see. Because um, mm. I, I like the, the way they the blended the the modern and the historic and the fantasy elements into this very unique setting and if they continue with uh you know creature designs like that as well that don't look like typical monsters they're they're, they're very um different i think uh what was that film uh pan's labyrinth that come comes to mind mm. um and you know the, the creatures in that are very unique um and it kind of has a similar vibe to that, sort of a dark fairy tale kind of story. Uh, so, yeah, this is definitely my favorite pick of the month. So, uh, thank you for finding it and sharing it with us. I'm glad you liked it. Phil, what did you think? Yeah, that's a, you brought up a really great point, Damien, talking about, and I didn't even think about it while watching it, but yeah, how do you, how did they animate so effectively those, uh, some of those creatures? It, it, it is a, 
it, it it's one of those things that it reminds you how much you you don't know yet yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know i feel like i've i've learned a lot over the years but boy there's just volumes of stuff that i don't i don't yet get i i i, I couldn't begin to even theorize an answer for that that's that's fascinating um yeah there's definitely uh dark souls slash elden rings vibe particularly in the creature design which i think for me is the highlight of this mm. this film um because they are they're they're uh they're they're just they're not like what you typically see you know um i feel like that the that the the way they modeled the main character is is just strange to me like it 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 doesn't really seem to fit with the rest of that like you factor that out and maybe maybe tweak and grit up the characters at the end, you know, in that end uh, meeting, mm -hmm. a little bit, uh, then maybe it all fits into Elden Ring. But that main character doesn't at all. It's straight out of a. It's a Disney Pixar vibe for sure. Mm. So that was confusing to me, even because I I I found my mind shifting at various points when watching this, trying to kind of contextualize what I was seeing. And up until she removed her helmet, I was definitely getting an Elden Ring vibe. And then there were parts of me that stayed with that as they showed more different creatures and stuff. But when the, they showed her, uh, I, I got confused. I'm like, well, maybe this is more of a Tomb Raider thing, but, but then it, it just not really. And and then the whole, you kind of moved past it pretty quick, Tracy, but I feel like that that nondescript treasure yeah it, it's it's basically as what is it, it what, what's the phrase uh, the term uh mcguffin mm -hmm. it's just a device that's in the story just to move the story it doesn't matter it's just it's like all this thought into the world building and these this the creature design and all we can get is just some shiny stone i guess of some kind like it, there was nothing intriguing or anything about that object that screamed i'm valuable i'm worth all this trouble you know and you don't really ever have that problem in indiana jones or tomb raider for that matter um whether you fully understand what the value of the thing is it looks valuable it looks important it looks worth Indy risking his life or Laura risking her life to go get. And this is just like that. It's just, yeah, I don't know. So I, I found that odd um, given the amount of detail that was put into so many other aspects of it. Why, why, why is that so plain? Um, and I don't know the answer to that. Um, and it wasn't revealed, was it? No. Which, no. Uh... It it was literally a MacGuffin, like what what they call a MacGuffin, which is just it's just a device, uh, a story device that, for whatever reason, we're not going to invest any. I mean, it's a static object; it doesn't even have to move. How 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 hard would it be to make it into a little, even imitate something from Tomb Raider, make it like a golden statuette with an emerald in its belly or something? But no, you, nothing, um... just. You mentioned Indiana Jones there, and I'm thinking after this film, that stone is going to be shipped off to a warehouse like the Ark of the Covenant was. <laughs> yeah. Right. And you're right? never going to see it again. And that's 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 it. Yeah. Did, but did you get So and I get it that, okay, so the object so maybe the object isn't important for the for the overall story arc or for the word of building. But humorous, you know? Yeah. Hmm. So you never talk about it again, but make it something that we talk about. What was that thing? You know? Wow, what happened to that thing? That thing was beautiful. I can see why she wanted that. There's no sense of that at all. It's this sense of what are you doing here? You know? So uh sound design. Sound design was really interesting on this. I feel like I don't think this is actually the case, but I feel like that if this was the case, we wouldn't be surprised. 
that there were two sound designers in this. One did all the sound design for the quiet, subtle moments in this short. And that person is a master. And then there's a separate sound design person that was in charge of all the big noises, the creature whooshing its sword and the, the things falling and the stomping on the ground. And that person needs to work with the first person more on what to do. They just... What so do there's think? this. So the end result is this mix of in the quiet, subtle moments of this, the sound design is just delicious. It's so good. Like, I mean, pro, pro quality. But then when it gets into the battle, even the creatures scream when the, when the creature gets struck, when she's fighting it, you know, and the creature gets injured. And the scream is just kind of this, this anemic, very thin sounding, you know, give this thing some gravitas, you know, make it, make it, make it scary or something. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, I guess in that regard, it doesn't compare as favorably to Elden Ring or to a world like Elden Ring, because in that, when you're facing a big, badass something, it sounds like it too. It doesn't just look like it. It sounds like it. You're fighting some, I've seen scenes where you're this warrior and you're fighting this giant and it feels like it. It's like Shadow of the Colossus or something. I mean, it's just, it's this huge, the, the air moves when they move and when they roar, it's, roar, you know, it's this giant sound. And I'm, I know that the, the creature she was mainly fighting wasn't, wasn't like a, pro wrestler or something it wasn't big and muscular but it was big and it and it apparently was powerful and it just the, the sound really let down the side on that i feel like so uh that was a little confusing um the, such a distinct difference in quality and effort that i i can't help but wonder if there weren't two different sound designers involved just a, just a theory um well you know what you say that there was a yeah. sound effects pack being used and additional foley from a home. Okay. So you've definitely you've. There you go. There you go. That that would ex that's I bet if we They're were not to gonna go work through and analyze though, the specific they? sounds, yeah, it would. Yeah, and and it's. I don't know. I I'm uh, and Ricky's the same way. I think too. We're we're real sticklers for good sound. You know, like we know it when it's there. We really celebrate it. When it's not. Um, so um I loved uh on the plus side of the sound design in the final meeting there was the one character who had kind of a metallic sound mm -hmm. to their voice that could have been done a little better but it was nice it it was easy on the ears it 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 just conveyed something it was a different sound uh that was that that character's voice was really well done um, I like the fact that the protagonist, uh, the lead character, that she didn't say much uh, throughout the whole film. Uh, that that is, uh, yeah, a plus. That right? creates some intrigue about her, some mystery about her, and that was very effectively done. Uh, I don't know. It, it, I I don't know even what she, what she would have said, but like even at the very end when they're kind of saying. You know, we'll be in touch, and she just just kind of waves or gives a salute or whatever she did there at the end. Doesn't say a word. Doesn't even look around. It's like, all right, I'm interested in that character. I just I'm not as interested in how they chose to render her because it does. It feels she does give the vibe of Saturday morning cartoons or Scooby Doo or something or or. Yeah. Even if you, if you were doing a kids version of Tomb Raider or something like yeah. that's what, that. But the rest of it is Doesn't. like almost gothic horror, you know, and and uh, if you're going to have gothic horror in it, then why not make that consistent? Put some dirt on her, give her some grit, give her an unusual face or really piercing eyes or 
I mean, make her look tough, make her look like she's been through something. And instead it's this, it's almost Tinkerbell. I mean, I, I hate to be, I don't want to be all condescending, but it just, it just didn't fit for me. Um, like that, that it's like that character was designed by a different artist than most of the rest of the, of the film, certainly different from the other characters. And I think the reason that that's maybe a shame is because, I mean, go to go to ArtStation or uh, DeviantArt or one of those websites where you know people are designing characters, or even look at some of the stuff that people are doing with AI generated characters, and they're so much more interesting looking. Um, and you know, if they were concerned that the the character needed to be beautiful or something. Well, you could still do that, but you know, uh, I don't, I don't know. I think it's not that the character needed to be ugly or unattractive or something. It's just, you know, a, a little bit more interesting and, and a little bit more at home in that world uh, would have made more sense, I think, uh, and would have kind of crystallized okay, this is where we're at, wherever it is, because we don't really know, right? They haven't really told us too much. But visually, I, if I came back to this place, I could identify it, you know, that kind of level of, of recognition. And I feel like that, that her design was just, it's just a little too smooth, a little too smoothed off edges, you know, a little, they, they sanded her down too much or something, you know, it just, so, uh, yeah, overall, I'm very intrigued. I would love to see more of that world. Those creatures are amazing. The half something, half tree, again, in a great moment of sound design there when it flops onto the ground and it sounds exactly like it's supposed to, you know, yeah. um, really great stuff. Uh, but there's, there's just, there's a couple elements of it that it's it's just like what what were they thinking there and I I don't know you know the the, the MacGuffin stone and the the main character and then just you know get some some sounds I think that are more appropriate for those bigger actions. It's a perfect and, Disney uh, pitch. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. See, I don't know. I'm trying to think about it. Okay, if I think about this film as a a pitch. Uh, it, certain things are going to appeal to to certain audiences, you know. I mean, if if you if this thing was fully in the Elden world world vibe, then you're hoping somebody on the panel you're pitching to is remembers the the so called dark days era of Disney when they really ventured out and did some interesting stuff in the early eighties. Remember, remember something wicked this way comes. Oh yes, that was a Disney movie. Yes, have you ever seen that, Damien? Yeah, long time ago, but yeah. Ooh, one of the scariest movies ever. So good. Yeah. Um. Oh, what was the? Uh, I can't remember the name of the actor. The it was an old, very classic actor who played the grandpa in that. I can't. Remember. I can't remember his name now. Oh, it's so good. Jason something. Uh, wonderful, wonderful movie. You know, but this is it's like. All of this fits into to tapping into that Elden Ring vibe, which is very popular, uh, especially amongst uh, uh, teens and young adults. I mean that 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 vibe, that game. There, there, people who play a game like that, like Ricky does, they they seek out other stuff like that. There's something about that that decaying world that just is part of the zeitgeist right now for them. You know, it just really resonates. So they, they, they're they onto something there. But, you know, to put, you know, a, a, a character from Pixar in the, in the midst of that, it, to me, it's just confusing. Um, it, do, it doesn't, it doesn't quite make, make sense. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot to like about this for sure. And the production quality overall, factoring out decisions I might disagree with, the, the, the polish, the sheen on this. Um, I mean, it's really good. Really, really, really good. Really well made. So 
yeah, I guess that that's where I come down on it is I question some of the decisions in the production, but in terms of was this quality? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Jason Robarts. That's it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So oh, he was just—he was wonderful in that. I had to um, look him up when you were saying that. I couldn't remember either. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it makes me want to see that movie again. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's just I mean, the whole, the tornado and all of that. Oh my gosh, I just still can't believe I watched that on the Disney Channel <laughs> on cable still... when I was young. I can't <laughs> believe that's a Disney movie. It was so scary. Oh, it's so effective. So. Anyway, yeah, that's 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 my take on it. Is uh, a lot to admire here for sure. Um, just parts of it a little confusing. Brilliant. Oh, I'm the host, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> here, I'm just waiting. Just well, what do we do now? Uh, yeah, what do you guys think, uh, listeners, watchers? What do you think of this film? Uh, watch it and let us know. Uh, like you, Tracy, I. I I also, I didn't have any trouble, in spite of my misgivings, I didn't have any trouble making it through the 11 minutes of this, yeah. and I thought I would. Yeah. I thought, sure, I would. Um, but, no, nah, it, it did rope me in, so, you know, maybe they were more successful than I'm giving them credit for. Uh, what do you listeners think? Let us know at talk at completelymachinima.com, or drop us a note in the comments. We'd love to hear from you. On behalf of my co-hosts, Damien and Tracy, and in absentia, Ricky, we will see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye.